We did this study last year, and it was done with Ms. R.V. Joy Manihar, a research analyst of PIDS. So it's been a year since we have uh, started working on this, but uh, still I think we need to cover more grounds. Now. So probably this is an evolving work, and uh, we'll be doing more of the same in the coming years. So let's uh, go to the next slide. The outline of presentation, so we'll be introducing study, its background, the methods we have applied, and uh, the key results of the study. Looking at the global and the Philippine landscape, in terms of policy, policy evolution and institutions related to solid waste management, waste generation and facilities, that's what we have and what has been recorded by DNR, case studies on solid waste management as we look into local government grounding of the policy, waste management in the time of COVID, little flavor of what is current, penalties and incentives, strategic options for solid waste management, then eventually the, the core insights from this uh, review. Slide, please. So the um, increase in waste generation is linked by literature essentially to rapid urbanization, lifestyle changes, and consumption patterns. In the Philippines, we have been seeing a rapid increase in, in waste generation, not only in urban centers, but also in the provinces, in the rural communities. Daily waste generation in the Philippines is around 40,000 metric tons, expected to double by 2025 from previous estimates. Compounding the problems are leachate inclusion, water pollution, climate change related uh, impacts and disaster risks. RA 9003 or the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act was passed in 2001 to address waste management concerns with most mandates devolved to local government units consistent with uh, the local government code or RA 7160. Next slide please. So the objectives of the study are review the provisions and grounding of the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act of 2000 and related policies, conduct case studies on local government implementation of solid waste management, and recommend ways forward. So this is a very straightforward study. We essentially looked at the policy, the landscape in terms of what we have in the country, and then we looked at certain cases in our localities. Policy questions to be answered, or what we answered are, what issues predominate in LGU grounding of solid waste management? And then what policy augmentations are required or seen needed? Next slide, please. So we did a process evaluation of RA 9003, looking at the provisions, looking at uh, how it was grounded, both nationally and subnationally. And then we looked at case studies uh, in, four, in four representative sites, particularly in Quezon City, where we have Payatas, uh, as a very well-known open dump site before, and now uh, it's closed as, as a sanitary landfill, and there is now mining operations in the area. Rizal, uh, the province, and Teresa, the municipality, Bulacan and Pampanga has also to of our case study sites. And then we did key informant interviews, focus group discussions with our key stakeholders, including our institutional partners from the ENR, um, PSA from our CSOs, including Gaia, and then our LGU coverage, mostly from our case study sites. Next slide, please. So looking at the global landscape we have, the higher the GDP per capita income of a country, we are looking at more generation of plastics and papers. Compare that to those with lower GDP where biodegradable is uh, predominant. Incineration is used in developed countries, really, for example, the US, Europe, and other countries uh, I'll be mentioning later. While developing nations mostly depend on dump sites, landfills, which are actually cheaper to operate. Organic matter make up most of the wastes in Asia, making the region probably unfit or unfeasible in terms of using uh, viable incineration 
technology. 242 million tons of uh, plastic waste were recorded in 2016, globally, 12% of which were municipal waste. In the country, we have been producing a lot from our households, and later on, we'll be showing you the figures. 11% were incinerated globally. Slide, please. So what we have in the country is around 57% of our solid waste uh, generation coming from households. 27% from commercial establishments, and then the remaining 16 from institutions. In terms of composition, we are producing actually more than 50% of uh, our wastes as biodegradables or compostable materials. Only 27% are recyclables, 17% are residuals. From the projection of the NR and uh, National Solid Waste Management Commission in 2015, supposedly we have reached 17 million metric tons per year of waste generation in 2020. So I think we have to update this and see whether uh, the pandemic has also impacted this figure. Next slide, please. So RA9003 was actually founded on several other uh, policies, particularly as what we have indicated here, PD25 of 1975, uh, the first SWM-related policy directing uh, penalties for simple littering, the NRAO 199849, the devolution of waste disposal to municipalities, MC number 199839A, creation of the Presidential Task Force on Waste Management. The salient features of RA 9003 for the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act include the devolution of segregation collection of residual uh, residential solid waste to barangays, while special and hazardous waste were uh, relegated to the municipalities and cities. First, closure of existing open dump sites and transition to uh, sanitary landfills within five years of the policy's passage. Acquired uh, solid waste management board at each local level to oversee solid waste management plans subnationally. Slide, please. So the landscape's reach in terms of related policy, what we have here is a list of both baseline policies as well as functional policies related to solid waste management. Um, highlighting, for example, in terms of baseline policies are, number one, the Clean Air Act of 1999, the Climate Change Act of 2009, and the rest are indicated here. We also have functional policies that mandate, for example, the grounding of those bigger baseline policies. Slide, please. So we have a lot in terms of uh, what we have policy-wise. The essence of such really is the institutional grounding. And uh, later on in the discussions, we'll be looking more at uh, how to augment such. So RA9003 uh, looks into capacity augmentation, institutional mechanisms, SWM planning subnationally, materials recovery facility establishments within barangays, controlled dump sites, from open dump sites, as well as the transition to sanitary landfills, supposedly five years after the passing of the law. Post uh, sanitary landfill operations, R&D, environment uh, cooperatives and associations in terms of them also cooperating and complementing efforts. So those are to address, for example, uh, what we have to your left, which are what we have in terms of pollution, groundwater surface, coastal issues related to solid waste uh, proliferation and, and uh, operations of open dump sites. Direct uh, exposure of human population near or within dump sites, and of course, the release of methane gas, greenhouse gases, air pollution, also related to what we have in terms of our concerns on, on climate change. Slide, please. In terms of hierarchy uh, in our solid waste management uh, options, what we want really are 
waste avoidance, reduction, reuse, and recycling over the actual safe disposal. So we're looking at interventions at the level of the households, the barangays, before eventually we dispose the residual solid wastes. Slide, please. Institution-wise, we have the key actors represented there, also mandated in terms of policy, the National Solid Waste Management Commission, now being housed under ENR, local government units, which are given so much in terms of mandate and responsibility uh, through this policy. Pro the private sector, in terms of them also contributing, complementing, cooperating, in our solid waste management efforts and of course NGOs in terms of them lobbying for the ideals you know, related to solid waste management. Slide please. So policy evolution wise, um, I think this slide is a bit advanced because we'll be looking at later on our um, case study sites which are the four areas indicated here, Quezon City, Rizal, Bulacan, and the city of San Fernando, Pampanga. So funding-wise, and in terms of uh, priorities, what we have here are a checklist. No? For Quezon City, you have resources coming from 20% uh, era, coming from penalties as well. In Rizal, you have a lot in terms of sources, which include also the 20% uh, local development fund, general fund, meeting fees, products, as well as uh, contributions for from external bodies. In, in San Fernando, I think it's quite ideal that they are also linking with um, organizations outside uh, government. That includes CSOs. Slide, please. Okay. So what we have here really is quite interesting. So you have uh, the top 10 waste uh, contributors based on the waste uh, assessment and brand audit conducted by, by Gaia. The Global Alliance in Incineration Alternatives. So you can see here the bulk, uh, the biggest number, the biggest percentage really comes from plastic labo and the rest are branded uh, plastics. So Plastic Labo, you have that, uh, for example, the, the transparent uh, plastics that are very widely used. So they comprise around 27% uh, of the total uh, plastics that we have. And then around 54% are from branded uh, plastics. So this is very much related to institutions as our partner in terms of solid waste management and eventually cutting down such uh, residuals you know, that we have to dump in our landfills. Next slide, please. Waste generation and facilities, what we have here are 57% residential, 27% commercial, 4% institutional, 4% industrial in 2013. Now, in 2018, the waste assessment and brand audit uh, conducted by Gaia presented around 61% compostable, 14% recyclable, 13% residuals, um, which means that we have more bio biodegradables now and uh, a similar amount of residuals in the end that we have to dump in our, in our landfills. Slide, please. So waste generation uh, in terms of our key areas of study, uh, location-wise, Quezon City, Rizal, Bulacan, what you have here are indicative numbers in terms of what they have locally. So each locality has its own uh, character in terms of generated waste, as well as how they treat such or manage such. Slide, please. Collection-wise, what we have here is a good number in terms of revenues or returns and costs. 
And it's very apparent that uh, collection activities and material recovery facilities and activities generate returns. So SWM activities incur costs, incur costs but uh, in the end, there are also very rewarding activities that can generate uh, resources uh, that can be infused uh, in their solid waste management systems or schemes. So this is from the uh, ASPBI uh, survey of our Philippine business in, and industries, as well as the census from 2002, 2015. Next slide, please. Waste survey, um, if you're going to look at diverting wastes, the case of San Fernando, I guess, is very uh, enlightening. Um, they have claimed around 93% compliance to RA9003 with around 76% uh, diversion of their solid wastes in 2017. So that's a good figure. That's a, that's a very promising figure that can be um, used at probably used as a template you know, for other LGUs to, to emulate, to follow uh, in terms of what they have been doing in San Fernando. Next slide, please. In terms of the number of uh, material recovery facilities established, supposedly all barangays are mandated to have their own. But uh, what you have here is, is uh, a figure that's not really one one is to one so around 10,340 servicing 13,611 barangays and in terms of materials we have your paper aluminum other metals glass as uh, materials that can be recovered collected recycled reused and uh, our collectors can be from both the bureaucracy as well as our street collectors from the informal uh, sector working within solid waste management systems. So you can see here that, for example, going outside Metro Manila, more and more activities coming from the street collectors are being reflected. So they contribute a lot. Next slide, please. Also, in terms of the trend of materials recovery facility across regions, you can see it here. So it's a good trend. It's increasing. Um, Quezon City has uh, a low compliance rate. For example, if you're going to look at uh, local government uh, specifics, 36 out of 142 barangays, although Quezon City is very much empowered in terms of resource. So um, what you have here is a very relative compliance, LGU-wise. And that is probably very reflective of the rest of the country. Rizal, for example, has around 148 fully operational MRFs out of 189 barangays. So that's a good number. Next slide, please. In terms of illegal dump sites, the closure and rehabilitation of all dump sites and their placements with sanitary landfills were supposedly uh, Due in, in 2006, five years after the passing, the passing of the policy or the legislation. But uh, as we know, as we see right now, uh, we haven't met such numbers. Legally mandated in transition was not fully realized as many open and controlled dump sites are still currently in operation. And in the past eight years, between 2008 and 2010, as we noted that uh, the numbers decreased by more than half from 806 to 353. So this is a positive development where we see the lessening, for example, of these illegal dump sites. Next slide, please. So even though the numbers are not ideal, we are seeing a decrease in the number of uh, illegal dump sites. In terms of what we have in our mandated sanitary landfills, we also have much to look forward to in terms of augmenting this number. Only 353 LGUs have access to around 165 SLFs as of December 2018. So we may have more as of 2021, but the number that we have in 2018 
is around 21%, 22% of our LGUs having access to our mandated engineered sanitary landfills. Slide, please. Focusing on our case study sites, Quezon City, Rizal, Pampanga, and Bulacan, we'll just be going through the slides very quickly because we only have 30 minutes to present everything. I've just picked the uh, highlights from our, from our study. Quezon City, Rizal, Pampanga, and Bulacan, why did we choose such uh, localities? Quezon City is probably a very good example of a transition process from having a very well-known open dump site in Payatas to what we have now, which is... Uh, Closed uh, sanitary landfill, well managed, and now it's being mined post closure. In terms of uh, what we have in Rizal, we are looking at a clustering of uh, LGUs and Rizal actually servicing um, nearby localities no? in terms of what they have in sanitary landfills. Panga and Bulacan are also good examples. Bulacan, for example, showed us how non-compliance with policy resulted in certain uh, bureaucratic uh, impositions or penalties. And then Pampanga is a very good example of an LGU that has successfully interfaced with outside entities and GOCS in terms of clear service waste management operations. Slide, please. So this essentially uh, presents my uh, initial introduction to the case study sites. I think uh, it's worth noting that Payatas right now um, is being used uh, in terms of uh, energy generation. It's, it's biogas is being tapped by a private entity and now they are viably producing energy from a closed sanitary landfill. And that's uh, coming from what you have in the 80s and 90s, which is a very uh, bad case of an open dump site. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of policies and institutions, Quezon City, Rizal, Bulacan, and Pampanga have their own translations, no? functional policy-wise. And I guess that's uh, what we have in terms of cascading um, the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act. LGUs have the autonomy, LGUs have the flexibility to actually pass their own, um, their own policies, their own functional ways of grounding the bigger legislation. So this is a slide on that. And a lot of them have used, for example, linkages with household entities. And in this case, what's being highlighted are junk shops and those working within the informal sector in terms of collection, material recovery, in terms of them also earning from such activities. Slide, please. Material collection, segregation, processing, waste collection was observed to have better turnouts in urban areas compared to rural ones. Problems of non-cooperation and fit collection vehicles, ineffective routes for collection service are very common in terms of the articulated problems and issues from our uh, local populace. Barangays handled most of the segregation and collection part, mostly implementing no segregation, no collection policy. These are in, in ideal case scenarios where you have very active local officials and very compliant to, to the policy or to the legislation. But there are so many LGUs, so many barangays that are also non-compliant and are not segregating, not reusing, not recycling, also not uh, being true to the policy. There are also attempts, for example, to delegate collection responsibilities. And in this case, in the case of San Fernando Pampanga, um, there are private contractors being tapped to do such and to complement what they're doing within the local government. In Quezon City, uh, they have implemented macro micro cell-based collection systems for residential areas. So it's quite difficult, for example, to to impose waste segregation in households, and you have to be very meticulous in terms of uh, following policy and imposing such, and probably imposing penalties in the end. 
So LTUs have the flexibility. LTUs also have their own ways of dumping such provisions of the legislation. Next slide, please. So the informal economy bridged the gaps no, that we have in terms of uh, the local solid waste management landscape. In this case, junk shops are serving as pseudo material recovery facilities for those barangays without such. Although, ideally, uh, you have barangays with MRFs, uh, but in reality, some of them are, are in clusters no, with a single MRF servicing several barangays. But in some areas, they have uh, actually made use of pseudo MRFs. In, in, in this case, the use of junk shops, the use of uh, informal economy actors you know, in bridging such uh, shortcomings. Slide, please. So as you see, you have here an example of what you have in terms of byproducts from the solid waste management system. This one is from Teresa Rizal, where they have a very good uh, linkage with the market uh, and the product of their solid waste management activity, contributing to, for example, in this case, um, a cement factory and the creation of byproducts that can be marketed. Next slide, please. So again, uh, I'll be going through everything very quickly as my time is running out. Waste volume disposed um, and the tipping expenses of Pampanga. So it's not only them, the LGUs or the localities generating wastes, it's also them spending such uh, huge amounts you know, uh, to dispose of those solid wastes. And in Pampanga, you can see, you can see here, just looking at, for example, two years, in this case, 2017 and 2018, uh, the city of San Fernando actually jumped so much you know, in terms of waste generated, in terms of the amount of tipping expenses that they paid for you know, in disposing such uh, solid waste residuals. Slide, please. So looking at what we have in terms of COVID-19, spike uh, in hazardous wastes uh, production is very evident. So you have a lot of biomedical wastes, not only coming from hospitals, but also coming from households. ADB projected Metro Manila would generate around 280 metric tons uh, of healthcare wastes, health-related wastes, biomedical wastes. And that's uh, probably a very conservative figure. Next slide, please. So Rizal, for example, just to highlight a few of uh, our findings, Rizal has the strongest incentive mechanisms, uh, which include great facilitation of requests, provision of equipment, cash incentives, Barangay Resilience Award, incentivize our Barangay officials. Pampanga's programs were specific to solid waste management, cash doled out to assist construction of MRFs, equipment donations were given to best barangays, Highest diversion rate, best MRF, best IEC, and clean and litter free barangay, just to incentivize the local actors you know, in terms of them having very good food waste management programs. Slide, please. Strategic options for solid waste management you have here just a few landfill mining, gas to energy, well, as what you have in Quezon City. So they have closed their sanitary landfill. And now they have been mining it with uh, with fact partner. State of the art SWM facility. We have been uh, interfacing, for example, with LGUs even before we did this study, and a lot of them have been voicing out concerns about having no uh, SWM related facility, or if they have such, having very fragmented systems you know, related to solid waste management. So. A very good attempt probably to, to better something like this is to come up with state-of-the-art solid waste facilities that are encompassing in terms of coverage from collection to eventual production of marketable byproducts. So you have income generation supporting potentially your, your local workers coming from the informal sector. 
slide please vertical market linkage again uh, to have the sustainability in terms of operating your soft waste management you to have that linkage with the private sector and the industries slide please Subnational policy, structural and resource augmentation in terms of the bureaucracy, in terms of community engagement, and as such, you see a lot of challenges. So you have indicated here, uh, no capacity building programs, on source reduction, no concrete program, linking recyclables to the market, ex officio out of nature of our commissions, uh, subnationally, the absence of blueprints, of implementa implementation, misalignments, to development plans uh, within localities or LGUs, absence of teeth, cloud in terms of uh, rounding policy and lack of transparency, and limited resources within our LGUs. Slide, please. Shifting views on incineration. Now, this one is a very controversial topic. When you look at incineration, you're looking at something that's, that is supposedly against policy. But the Supreme Court has actually ruled in 2002 that uh, Section uh, 20 of the Clean Air Act really does not uh, totally prohibit the use of incineration. They just have to be compliant with the uh, clean air provisions. They have to have uh, emissions that are non-toxic or at a level that is not toxic. If you're going to look at the global landscape, you have Malaysia, Laos, Indonesia, Vietnam, Singapore, also looking at incineration activities, qualified level. Now, this has been very active in terms of local fora and in terms of local discussions because uh, there is increasing interest on incineration due to land shortage concerns. Landfills have been found to be uh, less in terms of lifespan. So, for example, Payatas operated only for seven years before closing, and uh, source reduction strategies have been ineffective. So just uh, to run through key insights, RA9003 failed to fully cascade. The SLF transition, institutional complementation, enforcement, and compliance, uh, I think were very relative in terms of looking at subnational uh, compliance there is weak regulatory governance and limited subnational resource and infrastructure provisions institutionalization of uh, municipal city and roles are very much needed in terms of them looking at this policy and its grounding the ANR and uh, the national solid waste management commission must be resolute and clear on policy and this has to be a whole of government responsibility, not only uh, on the part of the NR, NSWMC, and even the ILG. Empowerment at sub municipal level has to be looked at. Communities are passive. Barangays are heavily dependent on cities and municipal governments. And this is very true. We have locals, we have local populations that are really uh, not contributing in terms of local discourse on salt based management, not only discourse, but also decision making and even participation in, in compliance activities. Barangays are also given so much in terms of mandate and responsibility, but, are, but they are the least empowered in terms of capacity and resource. So that has to be augmented in some ways. Institutionalization of the informal economy has to be looked at as well, and strengthening of horizontal and vertical linkages from collection to linking uh, with markets and industries. So formalization of the informal workers and settlers, looking at their welfare, and then the eventual industry linkage for income generation activities, making the scheme sustainable. Slide please. Policy and institutional direction need to be harmonized. The Clean Air and uh, Solid Waste Management Acts are clear but institutional resistance need to be managed. So, uh, for example, the issues related to incineration and waste to energy initiatives. I think this is a very rich ground for discourse and uh, exchange of ideas, but uh, we have to be compliant with policy. If it's not compliant with policy, then we have number one, we better look at 
uh, whether the policy is still kept and applicable, or number two, whether we have to look at other options and interventions. Technology options, interventions need to be packaged and institutionalized for, for easy adaptation within localities. Revisit LGU reliance on policy grounding, LGU full autonomy is not working. So as mentioned earlier, after two decades of passing the law, we still have to, to see a very significant uh, grounding of this policy as manifested by facilities and infrastructure related to solid waste management. Infrastructure investment from both public and private entities, state-of-the-art SWM facility design with vertical linkage to markets for sustainability has to be packaged. So this, I think, is very doable, and, and the technology designs are there. We just have to package everything and come up with a local version that is applicable to our LGUs. SLF post-closure maintenance and operation, mining waste to energy, facility transition and transfer planning need to be also looked at. Public investment on SLF in the template of build, build, build probably can be considered. For example, just looking at providing 500 million for each province for the establishment of a, of a engineered sanitary landfill would only amount to around 40 billion. And you'll have answered so many concerns you know, in terms of environment, in terms of health, uh, hazard exposures, etc., etc. So a small amount of money can translate to so much in terms of returns. COVID-19 realities necessitate change. Number one, greater worker protection is required in terms of training and equipment. Strict waste handling and safety protocols are, are needed, particularly for biomedical wastes. Clean air compliant incineration, that's uh, a question for, for um, further discourse. And other technology options. Next slide, please. Well, this is the last slide, just highlighting uh, key insights. For example, if in terms of us augmenting institutions, in terms of us augmenting policy, and uh, in terms of the eventual actors. So institution-wise, you're looking at expenditure programming, technology options for SWM, livelihoods and welfare, particularly also for the informal sector. IACs awareness campaigns are as core programs within uh, communities for them to be more active, for them not to be passive. Policy compliance, last, uh, last, well, policy compliance in terms of institutions, LGU-wise, and in terms of individuals and households. Clusterings, institutional complementation, in terms of grounding also SWM policy. Municipal CTN roles in terms of them being part of an augmented bureaucracy internationally. Barangay and community empowerment, as mentioned earlier, they have been given so much in terms of responsibility. It's just right that they are given so much as well in terms of resource and capacity. Enforcement, penalties, and incentives have to be there. Policy-wise, the legal challenge still remains incineration and uh, waste to energy discussions have to be framed up, and they have to be compliant with policy. SLF post Closure management and gas material mining, which is evident, for example, in Quezon City as a very feasible, viable, operative uh, platform between both public and private entities. Evolution and oversight functions, public and private investments. I guess this is the last slide. Thank you.